gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. Uh, Mark Short is a PhD student at the University of Leeds. He's one of a number of students across the UK who is jointly funded by the CCDC. Uh, Mark did a Master's in Biological and Medicinal Chemistry at the University of York with a year in Industry at GSK doing Pharmaceutical Discovery and Development. He's currently doing a PhD at the University of Leeds in the Complex Particulate Products and Processes, CDT, supervised by Dr. Bowen Gwen and in collaboration with the CCDC. His project is focused on applying structure-based design to organometallic catalyst discovery, design and development using computational approaches based on the CSD and the accompanying suites of software. Mark's going to give us an overview of the work so far in his PhD and his talk entitled Virtual Screening of Ligands for Homogeneous Catalysis Using CSD Cross Minor. Mark, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. So this talk will be uh, an introductory view on the work I I've been doing in collaboration with the CCDC on expanding the capabilities of the CC CSD's cross minor software. And this is for applications in catalyst design, development and screening, as well as how we can use the output of this to predict the activity of the resulting catalysts. As chemical toolkits increase in size, both from increasing numbers of possible chemical transformations and the possible ways to achieve them, new approaches are needed or, or need to be developed to allow for faster or reduced experimentation in order to accelerate the discovery and reduce resource usage. This will enable the delivery of solutions faster and more effectively than previously possible. However, computational approaches are rarely used in catalyst design due to the lack of tools and the complex complexity of reaction processes. The CSD's cross minor tool is used to, well, it's based on structure-based design and is commonly used in the pharmaceutical industry to identify potential lead compounds for pharmaceutical development. So what I'm trying to answer is, can these same approaches be used in catalyst design and development as well? So currently there are a few approaches to catalyst design that are used currently. So first of all is your uh, sort of design of new ligands. So this is where you have uh, a lead ligand and you experimentally test different analogs by replacing different functional groups to find the one which is best suited to your reaction. The second is catalyst selection, and this is more used in process chemistry, where you're trying to find the optimal ligand or conditions used commonly through high throughput screening uh, to find the best conditions you use for a specific set of substrates. But what I'm trying to develop here is can we use a solely computational process leading up to a small or single set of experiments in order to reduce the time needed to do this process? So throughout this talk, I'm going to use uh, a model reaction to say, to uh, describe how we use this. So I'm going to use the Elman Goldberg reaction. Uh, this is an, quite an important synthetic reaction as it's the uh, a carbon nucleophile coupling reaction, and it's a possible alternative to uh, palladium. Uh, so as the uh, Buckwood Hartwig provides a similar transformation. Well, this isn't used in high amounts currently in industry because there are issues with complex stability and you need to use high loadings of the catalyst to enable to achieve the same results. This is quite an attractive reaction because the ligands used are organic and 43% of the CSD is made up of organic compounds. So this provides us quite a large data set and able to find new potential ligands. So First of all, I'm going to give you a quick introduction for CSD Crossminer for those of you who don't use it. So CSD Crossminer is used for rapid identification of potential lead compounds in a computational manner. So we do this by highlighting key interactions. So in pharmaceutical development, you'd have a protein of interest and you'd identify key uh, interactions such as hydrogen bonds or planar rings and search the search databases such as the CSD or the protein data bank to find similar uh, structures that have these same features. So as this ident use, as uses identifications of key geometries and chemistries, this is also applicable to catalysts. So 
This enables us to identify ligands which provide the correct chemical environment, geometry and electronic properties to enhance catalytic ability. However, we can't use the default uh, set of or feature database that comes with the CSD. So we've so I've been developing a new structural database used for catalysis. So this is very similar to the default feature database that comes along with the CSD or the Crossman software. And it contains some of the uh, standard features such as hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors, as well as planar rings, which are very common in a lot of um, structural chemistry ap applications. But because we're trying to apply this catalysis, we need uh, new features that we can use to identify key features for our ligands. So the new features that this uh, structural database includes is the ability to identify coordinating elements such as nitrogen, oxygen and phosphorus compa uh, compounds. And these can be divided into ligand types. So sigma donors or pi acceptors, depending on your application, as well in, as allowing for uh, more fine tuning by going down to the functional group level in order to identify very specific compounds. So in order to search the CSD, we need to come up with uh, Catalifor. So usually what you do when you're using Crossminer is you come up with a Formacophor using a structure of interest. And we're trying to do the same thing here for a catalyst. So what we do is we start with a base structure. And as we're trying to find a structure that has quite a low activation energy, we, the one we want to use is a reference structure that's based on the transition state for, yet, for the reaction we're trying to look at. So on the left here, I have uh, an example that's using the uh, oxidative addition transition state for the Elman-Goldberg condensation reaction. So what we do here is we can define specific properties our ligand must possess. So here we have uh, two blue spheres, which are uh, specific cat SD features that are is a general coordinating atom feature and what I'm searching for are uh, these features project onto the metal center using a, um, a dimensional feature that enables us to find compounds that are enabled to coordinate to a metal in a directional manner and then we can define other features that relate to our ligands so here I've gone for a very simple example where we have a bridge of two heavy atoms between our two coordinating atoms. What you're also able to do is able to define other features such as hydrogen bond interactions and ring structures. Uh, so we also need to define the substrate sites because we need to search for ligands that don't impede on the area that the substrates take up around the metal center. So how we do this is by using excluded volumes. And so another example to the left, this is the space fill. So on the top here, we have our pipiridine coupling partner. And on the right side here is our iodobenzene. So how we do this is we create excluded volume features on each of the atoms. And the size of these features are based on the van der Waals radius of the base atom. And this en enables us to define uh, an area of space where the ligands we search for don't occupy. And they list to ensure, ensure that the ligands don't impede on the area the substrates are, are in. So if we do a search with this, so this is a result from the cross miner. So if I just, uh, if we look on the right here, we have our iodobenzene. Uh, substrate on the right hand side where we have uh, no ligands occupying this space. In the center here we have the copper center where our uh, features, our coordinating atom features are projecting into and we have the heavy atom features. What we can see here is a nice uh, compilation of all of the hit structures that we found where we have two coordinating atoms uh, connected by a, a two heavy atom bridge. So if we go on to see the space fill, uh, this is with a Tanamoto threshold of 0.15. So as you can see here, we're able to find a specific uh, um, a set of ligands where we don't impede upon this substrate space. So because we need to 
extract extra information and able to predict activity later on. We are currently in, unable to do this through the CSD's crossband software directly, so we have to go through the Python API. And this is done through uh, a custom script. So what we're currently able to do with this is identify the coordinating atoms in the ligands. This enables us to build structures later on, as well as remove duplicates uh, based on their smile strings to enable show, to do in it to enable, but we're not calculating structures or energies for similar ligands. We're also able to filter with database annotations, molecular weights, so we're not uh, finding uh, uh, ligand structures that are re really large and unviable, as well as elements. So, for example, bromine or iodine, where these could potentially act as uh, secondary coupling partners and give unwanted side products. We're also enabled uh, to define root mean squared deviations between hit structures and your reference and the number of hits and hits per structure as well as export all of the structure files for prediction later on. So now that we're able to search the CSD for potential ligand structures, how do we predict their activity? So there are a couple of approaches we can use for this. So the two most commonly used ones at the moment in the literature are machine learning and computational modeling. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. So the original aim of this project was to use machine learning. However, we quite quickly found that this wasn't very applicable in our case. The advantages of it are that it is quite fast and it's based on experimental data. However, this does require you get quite a large initial data set from the literature. And this is very limited in the terms of uh, the breadth of data you can retrieve as most of the data that's reported in literature is mostly for high yields, very specific reactions with very specific sets of substrates. So this can lead to biases in uh, predictions as well as how do you relate the activity of your ligand from the experiment to the actual structure of the ligand itself just with a value such as a, a yield as Preferably you'd use kinetic data, but the availability of that is very, very limited. It's also very hard to determine if the trends you get from the machine learning model actually have are based on chemical principles and whether that actually relates back to the structure of the ligand itself. Whereas for computational modeling, uh, we don't have the requirement of any initial data. We can apply it to quite a large range of substrates and ligands because we can calculate the structures based on the uh, specific subjects you input into the calculation itself. And this is based on chemical understanding as we're doing uh, uh, DFT modeling methods. However, this does come at the cost that it is quite slow and there is limited reference to experimental data. So what we decided on was to take a computational modeling approach and therefore we need a few requirements of what this model needs to do. So we need to a way of predicting how active our ligand is. So the best way to do this is the calculation of the activation energy. We also need a couple of extra things to do with uh, how we treat the structures we get from CrossMiner. So this includes deprotonation of any coordinating functional groups being able to automate the calculations of charges and spins of the complexes we generate, as well as being able to reliably uh, automatically generate and find transition states for every single ligand we use. We also need to be able to use three-dimensional data so we can use this straight from the CSD as either an XYZ or a mole file or any other database you might want to use. And because we're trying to do quite a, a high throughput screening approach, the calculations we need to do need to be uh, pretty fast as well. So this is how we generate our structures. So we I use a customized version of the MolSimplify Python toolkit. So this is an openly available piece of uh, Python uh, code 
that enables the automatic generation of organometallic structures. However, for this use case, I needed to make a specific set of custom function um, modifications to enable it to use any to enable it to be used in our case. So this enables us to calculate uh, both spin and charge of the complex. We can use customized ligand deprotonation rules to automatically protonate or deprotonate specific ligands depending on how they would uh, be present in the uh, complex of interest. And we also customize the force field optimization methods to enable core constrained optimization. And this is a, a new method used to generate starting points for transition states using a templating method. So this structure based uh, based generation uses three-dimensional data as either an XYZ or a MOL file, or you can use a small structure input, although it's not really recommended as you're really relying on open Bible to generate a, a reasonable starting confirmation for your structure. So I'm going to use the example of the Elman coupling to demonstrate how this works. So in the Elman Goldberg composite, uh, condensation reaction, there are four possible uh, pathways that are discussed in the literature. There's the uh, sigma metaphysis pathways, this is the upper path here, the oxidative addition pathway, and there's two radical pathways, one through iodine atom transfer and one through single electron transfer. So this approach is not really useful for uh, radicals at the moment, so I'm going to focus on these top two here and screening ligands for these two pathways. So this enables the generation of requires the generation of two um, stable intermediates. So this is structure A. We have the copper ligand iodide species and the active catalytic species B, where we have the ligand bound to the deprotonated nucleophile. We also need to generate two transition state stru structures. So this is structure C for the oxidative addition pathway and structure D for the sigma metaphysis pathway. So for the generation of our stable intermediates, what we do is we start with the methyl we want to use. So in this case, it would be copper. We define the oxidation state of the methyl. So in our case, it's um, copper one, uh, the spin. So we're at spin zero here and the geometry, which is trigonal planar. What we can then do is we can take our substrates as either an XYZ, a MOL, or a SMILES file, apply our deprotonation rules. So here we want to force deprotonation because our nucleophile is deprotonated in our final structure. And we can also input our ligand structure, as, again, as an XYZ, MOL, or SMILES structure. So for our example, I'm going to use ABIVAL from the CSD. So again, we can apply the deprotonation rules to deprotonate any uh, coordinating sites that shouldn't be protonated in our final structure. And we can do a, a quick force field optimization to give uh, a built uh, structure for um, intermediate B. So now we move on to transition states. So these are a little bit more complicated. So to do this, what we do is we basically, you start with a transition state core so this is basically what you would use as a reference for your cross minor search. So it's a, um, a model of your transition state using a very simple ligand. So again, we can define properties such as the oxidation state, the spin and the geometry of this starting core complex. Then again, so what we do now is we do ligand replacement. So we define the atoms that we want to replace. So in this case, it's our two ligand nitrogen atoms. And we can add in our ligand as an XYZ small or smiles again. And we define the coordinating atom numbers that we get from our cross minor search and the deprotonation rules. We feed this into the uh, Python script. And what we get out after a constrained force field optimization to preserve the um, to tra transition state mode is an initial guess for our transition state structure. So now we have the structures that we need to start doing uh, calculations on. Um, first, we want to, so first we assessed how well 
the, this uh, method was at generating the structures that we required. So I took 300 ligands from Reaxis that are used uh, in the literature, and we determined the binding modes of these uh, either through inspection or by uh, comparison to CSD structures. And if there was no known binding mode through either both methods, we decided to calculate uh, all potential modes. So for example, here on the right, we have an oxalamide ligand, and there are three possible uh, modes of binding. So you have uh, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, both oxygens and both nitrogens. So if we run this through the structure generation script, for the intermediate stable structures, for all of the ligands, we have a 96% success rate at generating a reliable starting complex. Uh, this increases up to 98% when we just look at bidentate ligands. For oxidative addition, 86% uh, success rate, uh, increasing up to 97 for bidentate ligands only. And for the sigma metaphysis pathway, 93%. Uh, increasing up to 99% for bidentate ligands. So now we know that our structure generation is a pretty good method to generate our initial complexes. We then need to go on to choose what model we're gonna to use to um, perform the calculations on. So what we did was we did a benchmarking uh, set of calculations using uh, crystal structures from the CSD that were based on this active catalytic state of a copper bound to a nucleophile and a, a bidentate ligand. So on the left here we have an overview of the reproduction of the coordination uh, site around the copper. So this is reproduction of a metal ligand bond lengths and bond angles for specific or different classes of computational methods. So on the left we have uh, PM6, which is a commonly used semi-empirical method. And we can see that it's pretty poor, up at about 0.07 error. We then have a tight binding method. So this performs uh, really well, quite low. But isn't. as we then move on to, to DFT methods, these get a lot better. However, because we're looking at uh, well, we're trying to develop a high throughput method, we need to also look at the computational time this takes. So. For the extended type binding method, where for all of the structures, it only takes about 1.5 hours to do these structures, and this is single core time. And when we go into DFT, we're up at 84 hours, and for full DFT, which is a TPSSH with a triple zeta basis set, we're up at over 6,000 hours for just a, a single structure or set of 10 structures. So clearly, we, we don't want to be using DFT as it takes far too long. So what we settled on using is because we need to do transition state calculations as well, and in some cases this requires calculation of uh, a Hessian to get accurate reliable structures, we settled on using extended type binding methods as it's a good compromise between time and accuracy. So how do we do our calculations? So we use the Orca uh, uh, computational software suite along with the extended type binding software package by the Grime Group. And we've optimized this to provide both reliability for calculating uh, or finding transition states and flexibility to enable screening both a variety of additives and solvents. So what we do is once we've generated our structures, we say, is our structure a TS? If it's not, we can straight, straight up do a, a quick optimization of the structure to find the minimum. If it is, we do a constrained optimization where we freeze all of the bonds and angles in the transition state mode, enable to get the structure to as close to minimum as possible while preserving the, um, the transition state bond. And we can then go on to do um, a transition state optimization to find the uh, true TS for our structure. Once we've done this, we can move on to verify the, the structure. So if it's uh, stable intermediate, we make sure there's no imaginary frequencies. And if it is a transition state, we can verify that the presence of one imaginary frequency and verify that the transition state mode itself is in fact the, the bond transformation that we're after. And we do this with an automated script that uh, I've just been 
uh, editing at the moment and it, it proves to be pretty reliable at, at uh, identifying structures that contain the correct transition state vibration. Once we've done this, we can then go on to a high level energy calculation. So this is where we can sort of uh, start to screen solvents and additives. So at this point, we can do energy calculations and we can change the type of solvent we use and to enable solvent screening. Or we can then add in uh, energies or additive energies from a database and use this to calculate the final activation energy for our, our specific ligand. So this is an example output of the structure. So we would usually uh, give this an output as a CSV file, but I've gone ahead and plotted this. So on the left-hand side here, we can see our two stable uh, structures, A and B, and our two transition states, uh, D and C as well. And on the right here, I've given some uh, examples of the uh, transition state modes. So at the top here, we have the oxidative addition. And on the bottom right here, we have the sigma metastasis pathway. So for each ligand, this takes about one to two hours to do per structure, which is quite a lot faster than traditional DFT methods, as we're um, also calculating two transition states at the, at the same time. So this is a significant improvement and allows for a, quite a, a lot faster screening of potential uh, ligand compounds. So in conclusion, we've developed, or I've developed CATSD, which is uh, a feature database for catalyst discovery and development. Uh, this is based on uh, the CSD's CrossMiner software to enable searching using structure-based design for potential ligands to use in organometallic reactions. I've also developed a way using the Python API to be able to apply this to search the CSD for these potential compounds. And I've also given you a sort of introduction of how we predict the activity of these ligands using a semi-automated high throughput workflow. So for future prospects, we is we're looking in the future to provide uh, databases that are based on commercially available ligand sets. So this would enable screening of um, a series of commercially available ligands to determine which one would be best for your specific reaction. So hopefully later on, I'll be able to share with you some of the discovery work we've been doing, to, which applies this to the Elman Goldberg reaction to identify uh, new ligands for potential use in the future. And yeah, I hope to share that with you at a later date. So I'd just like to thank my uh, supervisors from the University of Leeds, as well as the advanced research computing team for their assistance with using the uh, supercomputer here at Leeds, as well as Claire and Jason from the CCDC for their help with uh, uh, using the software. So uh, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, please do put your your uh, questions in the chat box. Um, I'm happy to kick things off, Mark, and ask a, a quick question. Um, do you see any opportunity for optimising your computational methods by applying machine learning in there as well? So, you know, operating on a small subset with high level theory and then trying to to use machine learning to to bring the overall cost down uh so potentially it's possible but with machine learning again you're using or you have to um use a specific uh, set of substrates to generate that data and if you're doing that on the high level this is going to take quite a lot of time and then you'd have to develop a method that is able to translate that data on the specific set of substrates to a, a whole new set as well. So I think it's a bit better to use a computational method where you'd use or be able to define your substrates straight away and get that better accuracy rather than using a machine mod learning model where you wouldn't really be able to know if that that really transfers over between different sets of substrates as well if you're going to be 
trying to screen loads of different types of reactions as well. So if you want to look at, say, a different reaction, so Buckwood Heart Rig or um, Suzuki reaction, you're also going to have to generate that data as well for those as reactions where you could just use a straight up computational methodology, which in the long run may turn out to be quite a bit uh, faster as well. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to pick one of the questions from the chat. Um, Laszlo, would you like to come off mute and ask your question? So, yes, I can. So, <laughs> hello, really nice Hi, talk. Yeah. I was wondering when you mentioned that some cases the structure generation failed. Was there any obvious reason, like I don't know, geometric clashes or or something in the electronic structure that seemed to jump out at you as a possible reason? So there was a few common things that appeared. So especially for for monodentate ligands, when you're trying to fit two two of those around the metal center, especially if they're quite large bulky ligands, if you're using smiles, they tend to uh, it, it generates a structure where the, the ligands start to, to start to overlap, and they really don't generate very good structures altogether. And as well, because when you use smiles, you're relying on open barbell. It's we found that it's really not very good at generating uh, like specific conformations or translating that smiles into a, an accurate structure. So I do know that in the latest release of the um, the CSD software, they've introduced a, a new um, smiles to 3D uh, method, which hopefully we can implement and this may improve us in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for your presentation. That was really interesting. Thank you.